focusing on that and um and and it's grown into being just as equal a love as the double bass um and i did two of my three performance exams in my final year on the vial um this talk i'm going to do is uh, is based on my dissertation for my degree um and obviously it was originally intended as a real life presentation at a gamba society meeting which was at saint gabriel's hall in pimlico um so I've now adapted it for Zoom and uh, for lockdown, so I've got some nice recorded clips. Um, so, yes, I'm just going to share my screen now, and um, I'm going to start the talk. Um, so you should all be able to see this. Um, so, the music of the English Civil War. Um, here we have pictured... Uh, Two of the composers I'm going to talk about, um, William Laws and Christopher Simpson. Uh, I also have a picture of Roger North because he features fairly heavily in this talk. Um, here's a little guide to what I'm going to speak about, four main sections. I'm just going to do a, a rundown of uh, the history of the English Civil War with a few interesting little bits and then speak about these three composers, William Laws, John Jenkins and then Christopher Simpson. So here, here we have a quote from John Jenkins, um, who was a gifted wordsmith, and North reminds us he offered proffered, often proffered at poetry. Um, when fair Aurora from her purple bed arose and saw this island drenched deep in gore, she wept and straight withdrew her rosy head, minding to see this mournful earth no more, till that bright star which ushers her shall bring tidings of peace and blessings in a king. This is a very tragic description of uh, Civil War England, and I think it gives a, a nice introduction to the feeling of the time. So um, let's see how it all happened. It all started in London, um, where Charles I stormed into Parliament and demanded the names of five MPs who he accused of treason. When the Speaker denied him these names, he uh, stormed out of the uh, Houses of Parliament and decided he would... Um, set this war in motion. Um, he started by trying to take London twice. He failed both times, and so he um, moved across to Oxford and claimed that as his stronghold. Oxford was besieged three times, uh, first in the spring of 1644, where Parliament surrounded the city on two fronts, and uh, lack of coordination meant that the king escaped, taking with him about 70 carriages. Um, the second siege was uh, conducted by Thomas Fairfax and his new model army, uh, where they managed to build a bridge over the Cherwell in Marston, just outside. Um, the royalist response was to flood the surrounding fields, and this siege was abandoned when it was discovered that the king had already managed to flee the city. Um, the third and final siege was in 1646, after a string of defeats for the royalists. The parliamentarians chose to take this opportunity to strike at the royalist heart, and the parliamentarian soldiers occupied the hills to the east of the city, um, they wrote a letter to the city's governor, Sir Thomas Glennon, demanding that he surrendered. And when they didn't hear anything in return, they fired one warning shot. Um, this was the, one of the only shots to be fired in this siege, and it landed in Christchurch Meadow, injuring nobody. Uh, Thomas Fairfax and the Royalists spoke for around a month before the Royalists finally surrendered. Prior to this final surrender, the Royalists meticulously destroyed all the evidence about the Royalist cause at Oxford. Sadly, this means we have no first-hand accounts of the music at this time. Um, another notable city that was see besieged quite a few times uh, was Newark. Um, it was also besieged um, three times in 1643, 1644, and at the end of 1645. Um, in 1645, troops came down from Scotland and other troops came up, uh, up, from, uh, up from the south. Um, Newark was given up at the end of this siege under Charles's orders on the 8th of May 1646 um, as part of his personal surrender. Um, a first-hand account at the time says that because the city was under, under siege for three years, um, the people of Newark were struggling for food so much that they were forced to eat their dogs and horses. Um, a side note relating to one of my composers, um, William Laws uh, was actually shot on a way to a siege, wasn't, wasn't shot in a siege, 
but um, he was casually shot on his way to the siege of Chester in 1645. Um, next, we're back down to London for Charles's beheading in 1649. Charles was declared guilty of upholding in himself an unlimited and tyrannical power to rule according to his will and to overthrow the rights and liberties of the people. Um, in 1649, there was a pamphlet that claimed to reveal Richard Brandon as Charles's executioner. Um, it was speculated that he was a very likely candidate for this as he was the common hangman at the time. Um, he'd also been at executions of other royalists. Uh, Brandon denied that he was the executioner, and a letter from the time claims that he refused an offer of £200 to perform this execution. Uh, two years after uh, Charles I was beheaded, uh, the end of the Civil War happened. Um, this was at the Battle of Worcester on the 3rd of September 1651, when around 14,000 royalists and around 28,000 parliamentarians um, fought in a, in a battle where around uh, 3,000 royalists were killed, whereas only around 200 parliamentarians were. Um, this marked the end of the Civil War. Um, although it was two years after Charles I's execution, um, we must assume that people just kept fighting on uh, Charles's behalf. Um, Charles was very lucky in the fact that he managed to flee to uh, France, which was his mother's birthplace. So then we have the Puritan rule between these two kings, uh, known as the Commonwealth or the Interregnum. Uh, Cromwell shut down theatres, stopped cathedral choirs from singing, disbanded the king's music as well. Um, Cromwell actually loved music and the arts, and he considered music to be part of a gentleman's education, and most gentlemen made music in large country houses. Um, Jenkins spent most of his life employed in these houses. Um, whilst a fair few musicians managed to survive in London by working in other means, uh, some, such as Jenkins and Simpson, found patronage in country houses, where they worked both as musicians as well as having to spend some time um, as stewards and butlers. Um, as musicians, they usually taught the children of the house, composed and copied music, as well as playing with the family. Um, in 1656, there was an assassination attempt on Cromwell by, by Miles Syndicum, who was a former soldier. Um, this is relevant because he was known to carry all of his weapons into Westminster in a base vial case. Um, these included one harquebus and some pistols charged with lezen bullets and slugs. Um, Cromwell survived his, uh, celebrated his survival of this attempt uh, with a princely entertainment in Banqueting House. Um, after this banquet, uh, the company withdrew to the Cockpit Theatre, where they were entertained late into the evening. Um, Cromwell died of natural causes in 1658 and was buried in Westminster Abbey. And then we go back on to uh, the, the kings and queens, <laughs> and uh, Charles II was crowned in 1660. So that was a very brief... Um, run over of the English Civil War and the Interregnum. Um, and now I'm going to move on to talk about, start talking about my chosen composers. Um, so here we have a map of England and its counties as they were in the, in the 17th century. My three chosen composers were all born around the turn of the 17th century. Um, we have John, John Jenkins, who was born in 1592 in Maidstone, Kent. Uh, William Laws, who was born in 1602 in Salisbury, Wiltshire, and uh, Christopher Simpson, who is believed to have been born sometime between 1602 and 1609 in Egerton, North Yorkshire. So let's move on to my first composer, William Laws. As I said, he was born in Salisbury, um, where his father was a lay vicar. Um, he was the brother of Henry Laws and the younger brother of Henry Laws, and they were probably both taught at the free school in the close. Um, Thomas Fuller's posthumous account reveals the early recognition of William's talent by Edward Seymour, who was the Earl of Hertford, and he had John Copperario take him as an apprentice. Um, John Copperario was also the tutor of Charles I, who was only two years older than William, uh, which means they most likely met in their teens and would have played together. Um, William Laws succeeded John Cobraria at court, where he first played and then composed in the early 1630s. 
uh, writing the music for the King's Men and also at Royal Masks. Um, during the English Civil War, uh, William Laws joined the Royalist Army and is known to be living in York when it was sieged. Um, he was known to write a few pieces of music because of the military situation at the time. And one of these that I picked out is um, See How Carwood's Dragon Looks, which is a, res a round in response to the capture of Carwood Castle by the parliamentarians. Um, it's known that Charles I liked William quite a lot and wanted to protect him, so put him uh, in his lifeguards. Um, this unfortunately didn't save him. As I said earlier, he was uh, casually shot whilst en route to Roton Heath near Chester on the 24th of September 1645. Um, Charles I, because of his admiration for William, instituted special mourning for Laws, honouring him as the father of music. Um, Thomas Jordan, who is the author of Laws' epitaph, uh, writes a brilliant lachrymose pun on the fact that he died at the hands of those who denied him the divine right of kings. And this was... Oh, if it's going to turn up. Will Laws was slain by such whose wills were laws. This uh, picture here is the divine monochord, which is depicted in Robert Flood's The History of the Microcosm, uh, which in Latin is Utriusque Cosmi Historia, and it was written in the 1620s. Um, this shows a double octave being tuned by the hand of God on a single string. Um, as the string is tuned from low G to C, we move from the earth to God. Uh, at the time, C is a, a very rhetorically divine key, and a large quantity of William Laws's compositions for the royal masks were thought to be in this key and keys relating to it. Um, I don't think this is any coincidence. Uh, the unified tonality uh, distinguished Laws's composition and paved the way for the post-restoration operas of Purcell. Um, whilst researching Robert Flood, I, real, I looked him up and realised that he was also known as Robertus de Fluctivus, which I thought was a quite nice bit of Latin, so I thought I'd put it in my talk. <laughs> um, at this time, uh, sets were becoming more and more popular among noble households, and William Laws was really famous for his. Um, one notable set is number two in A minor in five parts. Um, in three movements, this start... This set starts with a fantasia, which uses great rhetorical contrasts. And we're going to listen to the first half of the, this piece played by my vile consort, Arcola. I just wanted to do a very short and very swift analysis of this piece harmonically. It's um, sort of the bit of this that I find most interesting, the harmonic analysis. 
Um, so starting uh, starting at the beginning, the, the first theme uh, starts on the fifth of the scale, which is uns uh, an uncertain thing to do with the harmony. But you have the bass bringing in the bottom A uh, um, halfway through the first bar, which unifies this and makes it very, very much in A minor. Um, we, we have lots of utterances of this first theme, um, and it happens uh, first in, in, the, in the tonic key, and then it happens a fifth above, and then again in the, um, in the uh, original key. Um, also, here there's the, the first theme that the bass has, this rising figure which is quite ominous and if it's played really legato really really gives an, uh, a sort of creepy air. Um, on the next page you have this second theme all the way through and um, in our VAR concert we like to use this theme to slowly build and add tension. Um, you also see here a few more utterances of the um, the first theme. Um, so the the first sort of I don't know how many bars twelve bars is is all based on these just these two themes um, as well and here um, we have exactly the same uh, notes as in the first uh, two bars first you know three bars from the now from the second tenor rather than the first tenor and the bass and bringing it back into the home key really unifies this tonality and helps to push the piece along. Um, here, in the two treble parts, there's a f form of link, and this this link um, we we used as a as a pivot point to sort of swing us into a, cresce a slow crescendo. And then here you see um, that all of the parts go quite high uh, before the before the bass then then drops down and then in the in the middle bar of this page you can see the stretching out going from an A minor chord to an E major chord um, so from 1 to 5 it all starts quite close together not very close together but rather close together and you see the bass moving down and the treble moving up by the you know to go from the same note to the same note but in the opposite direction and I feel this broadening Especially on the um, the chord in the middle of this bar, really, really um, emphasises that this is a pinch point. This is the first part of the piece finished and done with. Um, straight after this, it goes completely transparent with the, with the treble and the bass part, doing the sort of um, what we like to call the canzona rhythm, um, which Copperario uses a lot. Um, the bum 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 bum, as in Jenkins' um, Fantasia, um, and he uses it here in the last two bars, but in a sort of more stretched out fashion. We see this go through all of the parts, and it's played in every part, apart from the um, apart from the second tenor. So that's the that's the rhythm I've just uh, highlighted it there. Dum ba da ding. Um, here we have this amazing fanfare that lasts one bar. And it only lasts one bar, which I think makes it even more spectacular and unexpected. Um, leading up to it, the in the first bar, the use of chromaticism really helps push us into this new key, the G major, where, where it starts to become really triumphant. And then straight after, it then relaxes completely and goes to lots of conjunct movements and lots of very nice legato crotchets that we just move through but with still with an air of uncertainty due to the fact that there's little bits of chromaticism um, like in the a treble part in the middle and we've also got a descending line which um, a descending theme which helps to relax us I feel um, on this next page we have another build up to a to a dominant chord to an E major chord at letter H and I've labelled this with a big green arrow because the bass really drives this. It, it, the bass travels an octave and a half to get there. Um, 
with this dotted rhythm, and the dotted rhythm is um, is is uh, hitting against the dotted rhythm of the first tenor, which is just out by a crotchet. Um, and I put an exclamation mark to show that this is a very very um, prominent moment. Um, the next page is all very dance-like, and here I've labelled this English cadence, which, um, especially for me as a choral singer, is a very playful thing, and you quite often find us putting English cadences in where we shouldn't because um, it's quite fun to watch the director's face. Um, and here what we have is we have this amazing... Um, interplay between three parts and then two parts. Um, and th this joyful interplay is really, really nicely idiomatically written for the viol. Um, and this also takes us um, into C major on the next page, which starts off feeling very nice and relaxed with with the um, the tenor and the treble in the first bar just placing the chord and then you have you have the um the c major and then you have these um augmented you know strange intervals the second one's not so strange but the first and the third are very very strange to hear at the time and they create these amazing dissonances which are heightened by the fact that you have these um uh, these ties over and the suspensions in the tenor and uh, second treble we're almost at the end, and you have these amazing cries. First from the uh, second treble on the top A, the, its highest note um, in this piece, and then the first treble takes it one notch higher and goes above the frets and plays this soaring top B. And then um, after that, it slowly, slowly comes down with a lovely plagal cadence, bringing us to a lovely, happy T.S. de Picardy at the end. Um, I, that's a very, very quick um, harmonic analysis of this piece. And um, if you hadn't had enough of that, then we're going to go straight on to John Jenkins. Um, John Jenkins, uh, during the Civil War, like many others, he was forced into the countryside where he was employed as a music maker. Um, as you can see here, he worked with two royalist families uh, in West Dereham, um, who were the Deerans, and Hamon Lestrange of Hun Stanton. Um, according to Google Maps, this is a nine-hour walk. Um, it probably would be a bit quicker by car today. Um, these two families were friends, and uh, Jenkins probably moved very freely between the, these two houses, as the occasion um, required. Apparently, Jenkins was not officially attached to any household. Um, his pupil, Roger North, wrote... I never articled with any gentleman where he resided, but accepted what they gave him. Um, Jenkins was known to be in London before the Civil War in 1633 and 4, participating in the extravagant mask of the Triumph of Peace. Um, he was once also brought to play upon the Lyraval before King Charles I as one that performed somewhat extraordinary. Um, um, this quote shows the popularity of the Fantasia during the Civil War. Um, the Fantasia manor held through his reign and during the Troubles when most other good arts languished, music held up her head, not at court nor in the cant of those times profane theatres, but in private society, for many chose rather to fiddle at home than to go out and to be, no and to be knocked on the head abroad. Um, all these things were written by... Um, Roger North, who was one of Jenkins's pupils. Um, Jenkins wrote lots of music, but the piece I've chosen to speak about um, is a piece of programme music entitled The Newark Siege, which consists of a pavan and galliard depicting the clash of opposing sides and the mourning for the dead at the siege of Newark. The pavan and galliard of the Newark Siege is written for four vials and organ. It's conceived in a less intense contemporary style, which links it more closely to Simpson's divisions, uh, with which Jenkins was familiar. We know from North that Jenkins and Simpson knew one another well. Um, North 
likes to comment on uh, Jenkins aiding Simpson. Um, he was certainly a great master of divisions and encouraged Simpson in the division by list by a copy of verses at the beginning and some exemplars of divisions at the latter end of his book. Um, we're going to listen to Arkelo again, this time for a little bit longer because you need to sort of hear the whole piece. Um, it's eight minutes long, and uh, but it is absolutely fantastic. Um, what we've done is we've um, taken out the organ and added a third treble part. Kai, who's playing the third treble in the middle, he wrote this part and um, we edited it very heavily um, up to about 20 minutes before the performance. Um, uh, I believe this piece is l is in four sections. Um, the two are very clear because they're marked by repeat marks. Um, the first one, uh, the morning of the battle, which I think sets the scene, um, and it hints at a battle with uh, fanfare like the frames. Um, the second one, the armies gathering together and preparing. This has a a little bit more of the f of the fanfare like uh, rhythms and. Uh, utterances. Um, the third part is uh, the battle itself. Lots and lots of frantic bugle fanfares and the the battle is very very nicely depicted in the fact that the viol players are playing extremely fast notes um, and we all play it very loudly. Um, there's a very sudden slowing at the, v at the end of this as the battle has finished um, and the royalists have been defeated. Um, I'm going to play this video because I'm, I'm looking out for the time and so if I play it now I'll still have time to get through the course.
there you go. That was us, <laughs> us playing for quite a long time um, with only one camera angle. Um, if we were going to do it in real life, um, I would have taken out the repeats most definitely. Um, a little bit after um, the Civil War and after this piece was written, during the Interregnum, North noted that um, Jenkins uh, passed his time at gentlemen's houses in the country. By the Restoration, it is known that Jenkins was residing with the North family at Kirtling, Cambridgeshire, as teacher to Roger and Montague. Um, also at this time, Jenkins was appointed as the organ player at court in the private music, music, but it's unlikely that he did not attend that often. Um, North wrote that at the Restoration, he had his place at court restored, but the masters indulged his non-attendance on account of his great age, for they were, to a man, all kind to him. His last years were spent at the home of Sir Philip Woodhouse at Kimberley, Norfolk, where he died. Um, North writes... Oh, come on. Ugh. And now to conclude, as Mr Jenkins, he was certainly a very happy person, for he had an uh, interrupted health and was an, of an easy temper, superior in his profession, well accepted by all, knew no want, saw himself outrun by the world, and having lived a good Christian, died in peace. He was buried at the nave, in the nave of the church at Kimberley on the 29th of October, uh, 1678. His gravestone is very well kept, and it's inscribed... Under this stone, rare Jenkins lie, the master of music art, whom from the earth to God on high called up to him to bear his part. Aged 86, October 27, in anno 78, he went to heaven. And that concludes what I'm going to say about John Jenkins. Uh, finally, we're going to move on to uh, Christopher Simpson. Um, as we said earlier, he was born up here um, in Egton, North Yorkshire. Um, and we know that Simpson was living in Scampton, Lincoln, Lincolnshire, with the Bowles family when he wrote The Division Violist. Um, uh, as I said, um, uh, one must assume that he used the family's 13 vials uh, to practice his own compositions. Um, as I said earlier, Jenkins may have helped write some of the uh, divisions for Christopher Simpson. Um, he also wrote an ode at the beginning of the book, which I think I have put here. This is the um, the last stanza, um, and it shows how much Simpson, um, how much Simpson um, is admired by John Jenkins. Um, Pack hence, ye pedants, then, such as do brag of knowledge, hand or notes, yet not one rag of music have more than what got by theft nor know the posture of right hand or left. False-fingered crew who seem to understand, pretend to make when you, when you but mar a hand. You mayest desist, you'll find your trades decay. Simpson's great work will teach the world to play. Um, we know he was living um, in Scampton, and Simpson also tells us how much he admires his patrons, uh, his, uh, Rob, the, the Bowles family. Um, the first sentence of this, uh, Sir, this treatise now upon the point of becoming public, uh, doth, uh, doth first, as in duty it ought, address itself to kiss your hands. This shows a huge amount of admiration. Um, although it was published for the public eye, the Division Violist was originally intended for use by the son of Robert Bowles, John, who was an excellent amateur var player. Um, in the preface, which is on the next page uh, of the book, Simpson writes, True it is, this first essay of this treatise was not intended for the press, but for a private friend who desired some instructions for playing divisions to a ground. We know that this private friend is John Bowles because the 1665 edition is dedicated to him, as we can see here. Um, it says here in the box, One is that you were the chief occasion of this book, and therefore, if there be anything of worth in it, the world may thank you for it. Um... After the dedication, the preface talks of what brought Simpson to create this book. He states that although his methods may not be for everyone, they will aid some people greatly. Here he says, some will dislike the matter, others the method, some again will accept against this, others against that particular part or passage, everyone censuring according to his judgment or fancy. He also invites criticism 
uh, from anyone willing to present themselves to him. Um, if in this or that particular part or passage I differ from the judgment of any master in music, I am ready to s submit to a better reasons uh, when I shall hear them, pretending to, kn to know m more than the delivering of my own opinion. Um, he then goes on to talk about how the book came to be in the order that he has written it. Originally for John Bowles it was just meant to be instructions on how to play divisions. Simpson soon realised that he should teach people how to play the instrument too if he was to publish the book for the public. Um, after I had considered what might be said upon that subject and committed the heads to paper, I found as powerful motives to take also into consideration what was necessary to be known in order to those instructions, even from the first handling of the vial, which is where this, um, this uh, portrait comes from. Um, and thereupon drew all up into a compendium to the end that what was uh, chiefly intended for one might also be useful to others. Um, here we can see two of Simpson's examples that I was shown when I was first learning the vial. The first one um, on the left hand side at the top you can see the tuning of the instrument with the, the six different strings um, and you can also see in the main body of this image a three octave D major scale with fingerings above it. Um, the one below is one that Lucy taught me, the one of the first things I played on the viol, I think, um, which is an exercise on holding down the finger. You can see with the square brackets that's that intends, uh, he intends for you to hold that finger down so that it resonates more. Um, so in the next section of the book, after he's taught you how to uh, hold the vial and play the vial. He then teaches you um, how to extemporise upon a ground. He starts off with extremely basic divisions and works his way up to full-blown exercises. Um, the first example we can see here um, shows how diff how to move between um, two notes in, uh, in a simple way. Um, and the the second one shows not what he would call descanting on the ground, I think, and uh, these two methods can be uh, mixed, um, and that is how Simpson um, writes all these absolutely stunning um, grounds, uh, which I'm going to finish my presentation by playing one for you. Um, I'm going to play this one that's on your s on the right hand side of your screen, um, but my plan is to let you have a look at this for a second whilst I just tune up and then um, move my camera so that you can see me playing. So I'm just going to do a quick tune. I'm going to mute myself whilst I tune um, for a minute. I'll give myself a minute. Right, um, I'm just going to stop my screen share and you should be able to, what's happening here? Come on, why can't you see that? Aha. There you go. That's I mean, great. Now, if I shall I if I pin my video, then you should just be able to see me large, larger than everyone else. Is that a, does that work, or is it spotlight? It might be spotlight, or whatever it's called. I don't know. I don't know. But you'll be able to just hear me once I start playing anyway. Um, right. Let's play some divisions.
Well, that brings to a, a close what I have to say on um, on my chosen subject. So I'm happy to uh, happy to accept any questions. Thank you very much, Matt. That sounded great and uh, fascinating talk indeed. Um, I think if you, there is one question for you in the chat by Julia. Yeah. Any idea why Simpson changed the title? To this? Um, I have no idea, actually. Um, um, I haven't looked into the title of the of the book. Um, I'm going to look that up, though, unless anyone else knows. <laughs> um, it, may, it, it may possibly be because he, the second edition is, is in Latin as well, and it perhaps is easier to translate or something, I don't know. Oh, potentially. Um, this, I've, I've looked at both the editions all the way through, and the text is, is, I think it's quite fair to say that in the second edition, he's improved, he's tidied up his English, he's had second thoughts, and what he puts is clearer, and he's added new points too, so I think he, um, yes, maybe it trans better into, translates better into Latin, or he just went for a different title that time. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Lucy. <laughs> Could I make an observation? Yes, of course. Um, you, on your map, I was rather disappointed to see that you didn't uh, include Colchester, my, which is where I'm sitting at the oh, moment. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, because there is actually one of the very few pieces that's directly concerned with the Civil War was actually written for the, the Siege of Colchester in 1648, uh, which is a duet by Matthew Locke. And I looked it up, actually, um, surreptitiously while we were going on, so I couldn't remember its title. Alas, who hath been here? It's a soprano bass and continuo, and it uh, marks the uh, uh, shocking event at the time when two of the royalist generals were executed by uh, the um, uh, parlia parliamentary forces who had been besieging the town. It was a, basically a Puritan town, still is, I think. Um, uh, and um, uh, so they had the extraordinary situation of it being held by the Royalists with a Puritan town, but with a, with with Parliament uh, besieging it. Very destructive siege. Large amount of the town was destroyed, and a lot of people starved to death. Um, anyway, Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyle, who were the two um, uh, Royalist uh, defend defenders, the main defenders, were executed, which is a shocking event. It went, I, mean, I think, it went all around Europe at the time that people should actually leaders should actually be executed. Um, anyway, if, you, if you, anyone wants to come to Colchester, I'm very happy to show them the spot where they were executed. Which <laughs> it's, uh, the grass never grown on that spot ever since. Uh, it's behind the castle. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, I was uh, meant to come to Colchester, actually, a, a, few, um, yeah. a few weeks ago, but um, before the lockdown. Well, um, get, get, get in touch with me, and I'm very happy at a suitable, well, I, I, I suitable dist to to distance to show you it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, Colchester has no... Uh, major composer at, the, at, at, at this period, uh, so uh, and John Jenkins never came anywhere near. Unfortunately, <laughs> I just butt in on that one, um, for Peter, for for out of interest, were the two generals resisting an honourable surrender? Because it's normal practice in seventeenth-century warfare, if you resist a siege and persist in resisting it then death penalty is uh, automatically the outcome. So the well, two generals being killed would have been normal practice. Uh, well, you may be right. I, I actually, my source is this, is this book here, uh, uh, Culture is History by our local historian, Andrew Phillips, and I'll have a look at that. But uh, you, just uh, some people, you, you know, well tend to right. dramatize the violence of the Civil War period, of which there was a huge amount. I mean, the, the yes. death rate overall is greater per, per capita than in World War One. Yes, but it was mostly little people who got killed, I think, wasn't it? Of course. <laughs> but, you know, famously, you know, both sides were pretty violent when it didn't, when, when the opposing side didn't do the, the, the decent thing, i.e. surrender when you basically... Yeah. You, you, you're, you're probably right about that. There was an awful lot of bitterness in the town about, uh, uh, about the way it had been defended, certainly. Yeah. Um, and I ought to, ought, to, ought to point out that uh, Newark, Newark was one of the very few royalist victory, victories, so Jenkins seized upon that. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you.
thank you very thank much. Thank you, Farrington, where I live. That was a royalist victory. <laughs> oh, he, he, he didn't do that one then. <laughs> well, he may have done, perhaps, and it's lost. No, he didn't do that one. <laughs> well, you'd have to celebrate the victory of the side on which your patron was. Yes. Uh, he yes. couldn't very well have celebrated a parliamentary victory since uh, his paymaster were likely to be a, a, a rather traditional royalist landlords. So, so sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm butting in a bit rather because I, I, I managed it once, but I could, couldn't work out how, after the first time how to work the chat. The chat <laughs> thing, <so>. That's absolutely <laughs> That's fine. That's my excuse anyway. No, absolutely fine. <laughs> Oh wow, the Jill Davis transcribing Civil War news books. That sounds amazing. I'd love to see those but at some point. Um, since there's a, there's a big silence, I, I also ought to mention that I'm, uh, I'm reading at the moment Voltaire's History of the, of the Reign of Louis XIV, which I would recommend to anyone. It's incredibly witty and pro-British and anti-French. Uh, and is a wonderful read and, and uh, covers this period. Mm. Oh, I, read, no. I should say I'm reading in an excellent English translation published in the 1960s. I was going to say, not every historian would approve of his rendition of the conflict, but sorry, I'm no, just, of course, no. I'm just being no. romantic. I, I have to say that his, um, his characterization of James II made me laugh out loud. But, uh, Does, uh, do we have any more any more questions? Since there's a silence, can I just go back to the question of the title and the two editions of uh, Simpson's Division sure. Vile? I just wonder whether it's got anything to do with the fact that the second version is published after the Restoration. In other words, <laughs> might well have been marketed deliberately for a different audience than the first edition. Um, I, I'm quite interested in this because you know, I wonder whether Simpson is really looking forward to the new market, i.e. the foppish French style that Charles II notoriously introduced us. Peach describes it as saying there's a lot of rubbish that's coming in. Uh, uh, but <laughs> that was his view, uh, because, of course, he was more traditionalist. And I just wonder whether you have uh, I actually, uh, yeah. in detail yeah. the two editions, because, uh, you know, th th there obviously was a new market in 1660. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that with you. You you uh, know much more about this than, than I. I, I I I would say that the Latin rather suggests he's aiming for an international market. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, um, and I think actually it, it was uh, John Evelyn who disapproved of, uh, uh, and Thomas Mace who disapproved of the new French style. I think Pepys rather liked it actually. Like, no, 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 no. Like, Pepys in his diary. Says so he's very he's very critical of the superficial French chaps that are coming in, but I'm sure Evelyn would have disapproved as well. Yes, I a would. lot more, a lot more, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but remember, Pepys sort of says that Charles II's only musicality was he did, he was approximately able to tap his foot in time to a, a stylish dance. That's about as musical as he was. He's uh, very caring about yeah. about the kind of restoration music. Yes, I think that actually that was Roger North who said that. Sorry, I'm a bit of a know all about this because I'm just in the middle of writing a thing called the Personal Compendium, which is an encyclopedia on personal. And not so long ago, I wrote the entry on Samuel Pepys. <laughs> well, on Charles II. Fair enough. Um, would, would this be a good point to mention the uh, another event? Maybe. Oh, two, three, Peter. Yeah, uh, on Friday. Um, if you could bear another event like this, which I'm sure uh, after this I probably can, uh, there is a conference being hosted by the uh, uh, Foundling Museum in London, which is the annual Music in 18th Century Britain uh, conference. You may not think this is terribly relevant to the Gamma Society. In fact, I'm giving a paper on Jeremiah Clarke and his instrumentation, and particularly an extraordinary early work of his called The Song of the Assumption, which features two large bass instruments which both go down to bottom A and cross the whole, the whole time uh, and I shall be discussing the autograph score of that and also discussing other instrumentation issues in, in Jeremiah Clark. You can, it's free, you can sign up for it. If you go to the um, Music in 18th Century Britain website, uh, the Founding Museum 
uh, are hosting it. And if you sign up before eight o'clock, uh, what, what happens is that you, uh, you can listen to it any time during the day. And then we have a live question and answer session at three o'clock. And there also there are other, I mean, there are other interesting papers to follow. Not only uh, Olive Baldwin and um, Thelma Wilson giving an interesting paper. Thank you, Peter. That's very useful. Yeah. Would anyone else like to ask um, Matthew a question? No. Well. In that case, I just, since you're you're asking questions, I was just wondering whether Matthew could elaborate a little bit about the connection between Simpson and Jenkins. You made some comments about them, you know, they obviously being good friends and connect. Can you say anything about whether you think Jenkins actually influenced Simpson's style of writing divisions? Whether you've spotted any sort of connection there? Um, I think. Their, their, their styles are, are both quite interlinked. Um, I know that, um, you know, what we, well, what I know of Jenkins and, and Simpson is, is very different in the sense that um, all the Jenkins I've played has been consort music and Simpson has been, you know, um, solo, you know, solo viral music. But um, in, um, in pieces like the Newark Siege that we listen to, um I think this the the style of of the of the writing seems to be a bit more like um like the di the division style of um of Simpson y y you could hear that we that that there were points where we um were basically say playing very similar things but all elaborating on it slightly differently um, I, I, I think, I, I, I don't know how much they, they knew each other, but I, I know that it, it was enough for them to, well, we, we know that, um, Jenkins helped write some of the, of the, of the, of the well, some, some divisions yeah, with Simpson, so I don't, I don't know how directly they, Elizabeth? Him, but, where are you? Um, okay. Yeah, that's my that's my very vague answer to your Alice question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Matthew, Matthew have a look at. Have you seen Christopher Simpson's The Seasons? No, I, well, I have heard them, but I've never looked. Right, have a look at them, and you might you might be interested okay, to I see think. the parallels between Jenkins' pieces for two trebles and bass, or bass and two, you know, the sort of thing yeah. that uh, he did for those kinds of um, writing. Have a look at those. You might be interested. Okay, thanks very much. Andrew Ashby's recent book on uh, Jenkins, the, the, his, his second volume of, of his Jenkins, makes the point that when Jenkins is writing divisions, they tend to be better when they're integrated into another piece rather than sets of divisions like Simpson writes. So that he's, he, Andrew Ashby's point is that Jenkins is better when he's writing divisions as part of a fantasy suite or a piece for, for instance, two trebles and bass. Um, and I think f from what, what I've seen, that's probably true that Simpson has created pieces, as it were, using divisions, whereas Jenkins' divisions are a decoration within another contrapuntal sort of piece. So that's quite an interesting difference of approach. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, John. Yeah. Could, could I also say that, uh, mentioning Andrew, that um, a Andrew has finally retired after about 50 years from the Music of Britannica committee. And, uh, but his swan song, he, is, he plans, is going to be a complete edition, new edition of the Simpson uh, uh, Months and Seasons. Mm. Um, uh, drawing on all the sources. The old Dove House edition did draw on all, on all the sources. It includes an autograph. That stunned everyone. <laughs> um, I don't. I. I. I've. I don't know about this facsimile of Jenkins and Simpson together. It could be. Oh, that, that's that's for me. Yeah. I seem to remember when I was um, learning Jenkins and uh, Simpson divisions uh, that they came from the same same book, and it was a. A set, a set, a facsimile 
um, and it, it, whoever published it or, or wrote it or copied the music, and I can't remember if it was a print, I think it's a print, I could be wrong, could be uh, misremembering, um, knew that sort of closely linked those two composers together. I think it might be a manuscript now in Brussels, actually. Mm. Yeah. Are you talking about the duet divisions by... The duet the divisions. I think that's in the Bodleian, isn't it? Oh, that one, yes. Yeah. No, so I thought you meant the Months and Seasons. Which is in, which is a, yeah, but they, they, yeah. they sit next to one another in the book. Yeah. And the pieces alternate between Jenkins and Simpson. Yeah, it's in the Bodleian. I didn't know about that, so I'm going to have to look that up now. Quite fun to play because it's for two two bass files, and one will start off, and then the other one will will then imitate, and then eventually each, each one will try to outdo the other, mm. and it all goes completely mad by the end. Should, should I say it's really if I actually think for two bass files an organ, but uh, <laughs> again. Uh, and uh, I think also I want to add that I don't I hope I think it worked very well that when you were adding the extra vial to, to you know, Siege, but I hope it doesn't carry, as a keyboard player, I hope it doesn't carry, uh, catch on too much. Yeah, we, we, we're, we're not very fortunate. In, so there were, there were five of us and we try and play as much five-part music as possible. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and none of us play keyboard instruments you know, proficiently. So, um, yeah. That, that concert was, um, was a concert we did in, in February. It was our last concert before the, lo concert before the lockdown. Um, and that was our first ever full evening concert, which was very stressful because we didn't leave enough time to, to rehearse anything. We've <laughs> <laughs> all been there. Yeah, we all know that it was, feeling. It was also the concert where in that video of the new Exceed, you can't see it, thankfully, but I was playing on a lovely Kessler vial that Lucy Robinson owned and lent to me, um, that as we were taking all the instruments out of the van, the instrument case slipped and the, and the bridge cracked, but I still managed to, <laughs> to play on it for that one piece. And as soon as that piece was over, I let the strings down and took the bridge off and <laughs> put it in its case. So perhaps someone should compile uh, for the Gamba Society a, 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 an anthology of horror stories about, about <laughs> what's happened to vials. Starting with a famous occasion when someone sat on Trevor jo Jones's old vial, uh, uh, I think it was Heathrow. Yeah. Oh God. Oh. <laughs> well, worse surely was Leighton Ring actually driving over a Kessler treble. <laughs> well, there's another one, I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> it was Ian Partridge that fell over Trevor Jones' while. That's right, yes, thank you. Smashed it to pieces. <laughs> yes. And yes. they'd bought seats on the plane, and so they came back with one smashed vial and <laughs> sitting on a seat Seriously. beside him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Was it, was it Philip Thorby that was watching? He was going abroad and he saw his file being handled by the baggage handlers and he saw it just drop very, very slowly right on the neck. Oh, well, yes, I, I could give you one a version of that. that uh, I was with Crystal Thielman, Paul Odette's wife at Heathrow, and um, she had instructed the people to bring the, uh, bring the vial through instead of coming on the chute. And we waited and waited, and then we suddenly saw it. And she, they said, oh, they're bringing it through just now. Uh, and then at that moment, she saw it appear at the top of the chute. Uh, and she rushed across and, 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 and managed to catch it. Just in time. Yes. <laughs> Unlike poor Mena Herzog, whose, vial got, yeah. whose old vial got chewed up horribly. Yes. Uh, and then there's the story about how Paul, how Paul Odette's Thielberg got stuck in the in the in the baggage system at uh, Newark Airport. We won't quite go. Thomas, you know that Myrna's file has been beautifully restored now. That's great to hear. Does it sound better than before? You appear to have been muted when you were speaking. Oh, I, I've never heard it before or after, so I don't know. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, we could go on like all night, couldn't we? Well, it's quarter past nine. <laughs> well, I think it's the end of the, of the meeting. I think if there's no more questions, I think I'll call it an evening. And to thank 
Matthew for his excellent talk and also to everybody who came and attended the, uh, the meeting. Maybe a round of applause, please. Yep. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Ad Adibi, thank you for organising it. It was great. Thanks, we must do it again. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, could I just say, on behalf of the Gamma Society, thanks to Ibi and Matthew for, for sitting off on what I hope is going to be a series of uh, Zoom or other online presentations from the Society. The fact that we can reach over 80 members like this, which we can very rarely do in live meetings, I think is, is a great uh, pointer for the future. Um, and also, just to remind members that if you haven't returned uh, a completed questionnaire about the Gamba Society, I would be very glad to receive them. I've had, a, I've had a, a smattering coming through. If anyone else has just forgotten to do it, pop it in, in the post or send me an email and uh, I'll gratefully receive them. Thank you very much. The, it's the great god inertia, I'm afraid. Goddess, <laughs> goddess inertia, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I, I think I'd be interested in contributing something if, if I was confident of being able to master the technology. That's the main, that's the main problem. Great. <laughs> this makes perfect, Peter. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, yeah, well, ha have a look at my contribution on Friday and see what you think. You right. don't actually see me, all you see is pictures. <laughs> okay, everyone, well, this is it. Okay. Uh, good night and thank you and goodbye. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Thanks, Evelyn. Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye.